<laughs> Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> this markup is going to include five important energy infrastructure related bills uh, dealing with hydropower, pipelines, electric transmission, and grid security. Some of the bills have been drafted with bipartisan input, while some are uh, still a little bit of a work in progress, and in large part, we're picking up where we left off on last year's energy bill conference. We have legislation introduced by Mr. Hudson and Ms. DeGette to promote small conduit hydropower, bill introduced by Mr. Mullen promoting cross-border energy infrastructure, a bill introduced by Mr. Flores promoting interagency coordination for a review of the natural gas pipelines and a discussion draft sponsored by Ms. Kathy McMorris Rogers to modernize the licensing process for hydropower projects. We're also taking up a new discussion draft that I'm leading to enhance state energy security planning and, emer and emergency preparedness. This bipartisan discussion draft builds upon the committee's impressive record of addressing energy security, emergency preparedness, job creation, and infrastructure protection. Through the FAST Act, which we passed in 2015, we made several policy updates to reflect evolving cybersecurity threats to the nation's energy and electricity systems, including greater DOE authority to respond to emergencies. The Enhancing State Energy Security Planning and Emergency Preparedness Act improves the energy emergency planning function established under a 1990 amendment to the Energy Policy and Conservation Act privatizing and elevating energy security planning and emergency preparedness is an important and timely step in the face of increased risks and interdependence of energy infrastructure and end use systems. So I look forward to continuing to work across the aisle as we move forward in finalizing this important pill. Today's subcommittee markup is an important step forward as we try to modernize our nation's infrastructure and breaking down barriers to job growth and economic development. The discussion draft, uh, again, remains a work in progress. I look forward to engaging with each member of the subcommittee and full committee to further perfect the bills before it would get to the floor uh, so that we can build momentum to get this thing done. Uh, and with that, I yield to the, my friend, the ranking member of the subcommittee, a uh, gentleman from the Chicago Cub World Series uh, champion state, uh, Mr. Rush, though he's probably a White Sox fan because he's got... Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Enjoy as a politician, I'm a fan of the Sox and the club. club. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for uh, having this markup. Uh, but, Mr. Chairman, I uh, want to uh, alert the other side that we come here, we, we, we thought we were negotiating on uh, in good faith on some of these bills, but and there was hope on our side that for at least some of the bills that we would be uh, marking up today, that we would come to an agreement. Specifically, Mr. Chairman, many members of our side have a strong desire to find common ground on hydro power licenses and committee staff from both sides have been meeting in good faith over the past few weeks to try and reach uh, common ground. Uh, unfortunately, it appears that at least two of the bills that were noticed for today's markup, the promoting interagency coordination for review, of, for review of Natural Gas Pipeline Act and the Hydro Power, Power Policy Modernization Act of 2017 are vastly different from the discussion drafts that have been part of the staff negotiation. In fact, Mr. Chairman, these two bills do not at all reflect any of the changes that our side had asked for, but instead move in the opposite direction and are even more problematic for our side to accept. Additionally, uh, while we didn't hear from FERC, Staff on some of the bills before us today, I would, I would point out that we never received a response uh, from you, Mr. Chairman, on our request for a hearing on the hydroelectric license modernization bill with officials uh, 
from the Departments of Interior Commerce and Agriculture, whose purview will be greatly impacted uh, by uh, this bill, along with states and, uh, and tribes. This is yet another instance where, once again, Mr. Chairman, our side is left to wonder whether we will ever hear directly from the administration on any bill or topic in our jurisdiction. In a word, Mr. Chairman, where is the administrator of the EPA and where is the Secretary of Energy, six months into the, the Trump administration. And we haven't heard a murmur from any of, uh, from the administrator or from the secretary. And it's high time that we hear something from those in the administration who have responsibilities to uh, this subcommittee and to the Congress. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's my hope that we can get through today's markup, uh, that we can go back to good faith negotiations and find common ground on some of these pieces of legislation without either side uh, going square off in our uh, corner and going to uh, our competing and uh, partisan goalposts. With that, I yield back. Come on, yours back. The chair would recognize the chair of the full committee. Come Thank the gentleman uh, for his leadership on this, uh, on these issues. And uh, I know you've been hard at work uh, heading us towards solutions that seek to modernize our nation's energy infrastructure and improve our energy security. To date, uh, we've held more than 10 infrastructure-related hearings and briefings. And just last week, the House cleared 10 committee bills to boost our energy infrastructure and increase energy efficiency. This Congress, we've examined the roadblocks to energy infrastructure and barriers to the gas pipeline permitting process, cross-border energy infrastructure, and hydropower facilities. Our previous work examining these issues has informed the bills under consideration today. We've learned that oftentimes dozens of agencies are involved in the permitting process, so it's time that we address these issues head on and improve the federal licensing procedures and processes to ensure that we get these projects to market sooner for consumers. Doing this would create good paying construction jobs and capitalize on America's growing energy potential. These bills would strengthen the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's role as the lead agency for coordinating the necessary environmental reviews and required permits, effectively streamlining the approval process to cut down unnecessary delays and challenges. I'd also like to take note that hydropower is of particular importance to me. In my home state of Oregon, more than 40% of our energy is produced from hydropower at relatively low cost to consumers across the district. Recently, uh, last weekend, I toured the Dalles Dam in, in uh, Wasco County, half of it is at least, and saw the firsthand the technology uh, and the generating uh, of clean hydropower for the Pacific Northwest. It's essential as part of our power mix. We have a great opportunity in this committee to help increase the use of our nation's hydro resources to better utilize this renewable energy source. The two bills before us today make meaningful improvements to the hydropower licensing process, modernizing our federal policies and promoting uh, this renewable energy source to ensure consumers across the country receive affordable and reliable electricity from hydropower, which by the way admits no greenhouse gas emissions. Pipeline and hydropower bills are not the only bills under consideration today. New vulnerabilities and threats to our nation's energy infrastructure and changes in the ways we generate, transmit, and deliver power continue to evolve. States are now at the forefront of energy security and emergency preparedness. The Enhancing State Energy Security Planning and Energy Emergency Preparedness Act would reauthorize and help us to focus a DOE state energy program to strengthen states' capabilities to ensure our energy infrastructure is protected against physical and cybersecurity attacks. Cumulatively, these bills represent a really important step forward in our efforts to put consumers first while working to enact reforms that build on our energy abundance, modernize our energy infrastructure, grow our economy, and create good jobs. So I thank my colleagues for their work on these bills, and I look forward to continuing our bipartisan efforts as we move toward full committee markup. And I yield back.
And when he yields back, Joe recognize the ranking member of the full committee, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When it comes to energy policy, we've had a good working relationship. It has been honest and constructive, even when our policy differences have led us to go our separate ways. But today, Mr. Chairman, I'm deeply concerned over the process that the majority has used for this markup. For the past few weeks, our staff have been negotiating with yours in good faith on hydroelectric license reform. We were encouraged by what we saw as your willingness to move legislative language that was, while not acceptable to my caucus, a very significant step closer to reforms that could speed the licensing process without sacrificing environmental protections or state and tribal rights. Those negotiations seem to be moving forward in a productive manner, and we were willing to allow your legislative draft from the May 3rd hearing move forward without amendment or recorded vote, and we may still be willing to do that. However, the draft released on Tuesday night not only failed to address any of the concerns we raised, but actually went so far as to add new sections taken directly from provisions of last year's Senate Energy Bill that we had explicitly rejected. And this does not bode well for making this a bipartisan process. The chairman also insisted on marking up legislation on state energy security plans that our members first saw Tuesday night and that has never been the subject of a legislative hearing or member-level discussion of any kind. And this is not bad legislation, but we're marking it up today without any formal feedback from members of this committee or stakeholders. And then there's H.R. 2910, the Natural Gas Pipeline Permit Streamlining Bill, which is a completely new and different bill than the one that was discussed at our legislative hearing last month. And it's clear from the text provided with the markup notice dated June 14th that you had this language for almost a full week before sharing it with us. Now, I guess you know, I'm really talking about regular order here for the most part, Mr. Chairman. I, I know that you and, and the chairman of the full committee always talk about regular order, but we have to follow regular order, and that's not what was done today. We want to work with you where we can, but that relationship, whether we're collaborating on bills or contesting legislation on which we disagree, requires a level of trust, and if we're to have that trust and be productive, this is not the way we should be doing business. And I wanted to speak to the individual bills as they come up, but I hope that today's issues represent an aberration and not a new and unfortunate way of doing business. Again, you know I'm a stickler for regular order, and that's really what I'm talking about here today, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. Other members wishing to make an opening statement? Gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll be very brief. First, I'm glad we're taking a look at state energy security planning. We had a tropical storm come across the Gulf of Mexico yesterday, come ashore at Sabine Pass. Tropical storm Cindy. She was deadly. Ten-year-old boy was killed by debris in Alabama. And while keeping people safe is our first priority, we can't ignore that energy supply failures can cause death and disruption too. Dive City hit America's first LNG export plant, Sabine Pass, on the Texas-Louisiana border, run by Chenier. Some offshore rigs of the Gulf were shut down, evacuated. All these actions may cause prices to increase at home. These threats are real. And as cyber threats evolve, we need to be ready for that as well. Let's get this right. I'm also glad we're tackling hydropower reforms. Texas isn't famous for its hydropower, but it is an important clean baseload power. We should be making it easier to build these sources of energy. Lastly, on pipelines, we need these reforms. We've seen time and time and time again that the current process takes too long it is way too messy. The better we do in getting the energy infrastructure built, the better our economy is. We need to examine these projects, hear all sides, and then make a decision. Death by review doesn't help anyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. Other members wishing to speak? Gentleman from Texas, recognized for two minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling up these bills. 
I'm pleased that we're marking up the, my bill, H.R. 2883, the Pro Promoting Cross-Border Energy Infrastructure Act. The presidential permitting process dates back for many gener uh, administrations, but Congress has the duty to regulate the commerce of the United States and cross-border energy infrastructure projects far well within that space. Opponents of this bill will argue that the executive permitting process has worked well in the past. It is true that in the past the process has been proven effective. Unfortunately, cross-border decisions have now fallen victim to election cycle politics. We cannot build infrastructure in our country on this continent based on who sits in the White House, a Democrat or Republican. The amendment would create a regulatory process in the Department of State, Department of Energy, Federal Regulatory Commission to permit cross-border infrastructure. This is no different than building roads or bridges or railroads. Department of Transportation coordinates that, and in this case, we will see the coordination for pipes and wires. We need to build electricity transmission lines and pipelines to move resources from where they are to where they're needed. The bill complies with the National Environmental Policy Act and it requires a full environmental review of any cross-border facility, including an analysis of climate change impacts. The entire length of the pipeline or electrician, uh, electric transmission will be reviewed for environmental impacts, not just the cross-border section. We should embrace the changes taking place in North America, harmonize our policy with those of our neighbors in the North and South. Um, and that's why this bill is important. I do have some concerns about H.R. 2910. Uh, limiting input when it becomes a NEPA reuse is not the right uh, route forward. And I'm concerned that the legislation for us will create new federal terms that will lead to confusion about re review types undertaken federal agency. Hydro, um, modernization of Hydro Act is I'm proud to support. I support H.R. 2786, promoting small conduit and hydropower. I'm also happy to see the subcommittee is also addressing state energy security plans. These are vital to coastal states and like Texas for protection against national disasters. I'm happy to see the problem reauthorized and I yield back my time. Chairman yields back. Other members wishing to give an opening statement on the Republican side? Seeing none, Mr. McNerney is recognized for two minutes. I thank the chairman. We're considering some important bills here today on hydropower, fossil fuel, energy infrastructure, and issues related to protection of our energy and electrical assets. It's very important to modernize electrical, our energy infrastructure, and I strongly support efforts to do that. This includes hydropower, wind, solar, as well as oil and gas. All of these issues need the attention of this subcommittee and of the full Energy and Commerce Committee. The bills before us today are an attempt to address those issues. However, I do believe we need to work on a bipartisan basis, and I say this in real concern for my Republican colleagues. We've learned on this side of the aisle through painful experience that any bills that are pushed through without significant bipartisan work and compromise are not sustainable and will cause significant political pain. Learn from our experience. Work with us to improve these bills. I yield back. Chairman yields back. Other members wishing to speak? Gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor is recognized. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. These are very important energy policy matters we will consider today, but the way we, this committee has arrived at the markup is very troubling, and it is not up to the high standards of this committee, one of the most important in the Congress that has uh, of such a far-reaching impact on the lives of the folks that we represent. Uh, to, it has become too common for the majority party to be operating in secret. Met, most of these bills have not received a legislative hearing. And that just doesn't impact us, it impacts the ability of the public to have, uh, to make any comment on uh, legislation that is moving through the Congress. And I'm afraid it's become all too common in this Congress. And bad process leads to bad policy. And I believe it is diminishing the stature of this committee to operate in that manner. And I think Mr. Rush also raises a very important point. Here we are at the end of June, and this it may be the first time that this committee has not had any hearing with the Energy Secretary, the EPA Administrator, on the health side, the HHS secretary. Uh, and I think that uh, is a real problem for the ability of the Congress to function. I don't know if it's a problem 
with governing or if it is if it's an intentional uh, attempt to just hide the ball from the American people. Uh, so we'll have we'll bring amendments an important debate today, but uh, until you improve the process, you're not going to be able to improve the policy for the folks we represent. I yield back. The only lady yields back. Other members, Mr. Tonko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, while I have substantive concerns with the Hydropower Policy Modernization Act and the Pipeline Interagency Coordination Act, I also want to express some concerns with the process that got us here. Many members of this subcommittee requested additional hearings on hydropower in order to hear from state and tribal governments and resource agencies. That request was not granted. I do not believe we have a full sense of the steps that should be taken to streamline and improve the hydro licensing process without undermining the interests of a number of stakeholders in the process. When we have received testimony from key witnesses, it hasn't always been heated. FERC has said it does not support the changes to trial type hearings included in the bill before us today. Finally, after last week's tragic events, our hearing examining uh, energy assurance plans was rightfully postponed. It has not been rescheduled and it was not a legislative hearing to begin with. Now we are marking up a discussion draft today. Now, generally speaking, I think this is a pretty good draft that I would be happy to support if we can get the authorization level right. But again, the process was not ideal. The state energy program is critically important. I saw this firsthand while leading the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and I'm happy to see the draft before us today to reauthorize the program. I have introduced legislation to reauthorize the program for a number of years, and I would encourage the committee to support an authorization level of $90 million, which is equal to what passed the Senate as part of last year's comprehensive energy bill. It is also a $35 million decrease from the previous authorization level. With evolving threats to energy systems, states are needing to do more than ever before to ensure the reliability, the resiliency, and the security of their systems. We cannot ask them to do more with less. And I thank the Chair for recognizing the value of SEP and for holding today's markup. And with that, I yield back the remaining bit of my time. Young gentleman yields back. Other members wishing to speak, give an opening statement? Seeing none. Chair, we'll call up the uh, Hydropower Policy Modernization Act of 2017 and ask the clerk to report. A discussion draft to modernize hydropower policy and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with. The bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered, are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Seeing none, are there, oh, I'm sorry, we have a call. Uh, Chair would recognize, strike the last word, the gentleman from Oregon. I thank the gentleman, and I, I move to strike the last word. The Hydropower Policy and Modernization Act discussion draft, led by our colleague, Ms. Morris Rogers of Washington State, is a really good faith effort to improve the licensing process for hydropower, which is an important part of our renewable energy system. Hydropower is a clean, renewable, and reliable source of baseload energy. It provides low-cost electricity to millions of Americans, especially in the Northwest, especially in my district, especially in my state, where about half of the nation's hydropower capacity is located. Hydropower has significant untapped potential. We know that from the, the hearings we've had and the reports we've seen. Unfortunately, the process to license hydropower has been increasingly complex, leading to unnecessary delays and uncertainty. While FERC serves as the lead agency in hydropower proceedings and sets schedules for those proceedings, there may be multiple federal and state agencies or Indian tribes that conduct separate permitting and environmental reviews. In testimony before this committee in May, FERC identified dozens of projects where the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has completed its work on a project and is now stuck waiting for another agency to act under uh, other laws, Clean Water Act or Endangered Species Act. In several cases, these projects have been stalled for more than a decade, 10 years. Congress must act, and we have a wonderful opportunity today to do that. As we've heard from FERC, they have a full workload, and the relicensing workload in particular is, stated, uh, to, is slated to increase and will continue to remain high well into the 2030s. Between now and then, almost half of our existing hydropower facilities will begin the relicensing process. It's our sincere desire to continue to improve this draft to improve this draft so that we have a strong bipartisan product that we can all be proud of. 
To accomplish that, we are committed to working to improve coordination among agencies and bring more accountability and transparency to the process. So I look forward to working with the ranking member, Mr. Pallone, and all interested members of this committee to try to uh, perfect this draft, and our work will continue between this subcommittee's efforts and the full committee. With that, Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, would yield to my friend from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand that our staffs have had productive conversations over the past week or two on Representative McMorris Rogers' discussion draft to reform the hydropower licensing process. We had a setback when the new draft was noticed for this markup because it shifts the goalpost. But we would like to continue to work with you toward a bill that can achieve broad support among, among all the members of our committee. If we agree on the goals, a more timely, reliable license process that provides certainty to the license applicants and that continues to respect state authorities and tribal rights and protects natural and cultural resources, we should be able to come to agreement on this bill. But we're not there yet. Our side continues to have concerns with the draft. There are threshold issues for each of us. We'll have to work through these things, of course, but I remain optimistic at this point, and it's certainly worth the effort. Uh, again, this should not be a partisan issue. Members on both sides have hydropower facilities in their districts and their states, and we want to see them continue to operate and thrive. Renewable baseload power offers many important benefits, and as I said, we share your goal of having a licensing process that moves along more quickly and avoids license proceedings that drag on for many years beyond the current license expiration. While happily most licenses move through FERC in a reasonable period of time, we have all heard of cases in which a facility operates for many years on an annual existing license, and that's not good for anyone. It doesn't get the enhanced environmental performance and water management that states, tribes, and local communities are seeking, and it doesn't provide the certainty and stability of a long-term license that the hydropower operator is seeking. But a speedier license process should not come at the expense of a state's right to manage water, public safety, the public participation, or at the expense of all the other vital economic and societal resources and activities that rely on the river's water and surrounding lands. When all parties to the license process work together, everyone benefits. So I hope working together we can strike a proper balance among all these interests and produce a bill that all of us can support. We still have a lot of work to do, but with goodwill, a concerted effort, and a willingness to compromise, I'm optimistic we can achieve a good product. And so with the understanding that we'll continue working towards the compromise bill that we can mark up next week, we'll forego offering any amendments today and agree to move this bill forward to the full committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, and I want to I just uh, commend my colleague from New Jersey. We share your goal um, that we do this without sacrificing our environmental uh, uh, goals or infringing on state and tribal rights. All stakeholders should have the opportunity to participate. Uh, in collaborative, transparent public proceedings where significant issues are identified and are appropriately studied. So I appreciate uh, your, your work with us on this. I know you're committed to uh, trying to move this forward as well. That we still have more work to do is, is obvious, and we look forward to uh, getting that work done between now and full committee. So I uh, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, both of you. And uh, I was part of a discussion last night, Mr. Pallone, and we came came to this agreement and look forward to working with, with all parties to, to get this bill in proper shape before it goes to full committee. Are there further amendments? To, are there Mr. any amendments to the bill? Mr. Yeah, Chairman. The amendment from Maryland is recognized. Yeah, I moved to strike the last word. I just wanted to pick up on the last thing that uh, Congressman Pallone was referring to, and that's as we move this thing along and make legislative changes relating to the licensing process the importance of the state role can't be um, overstated in terms of protecting local water quality. In Maryland, actually, this is a very bipartisan um, issue, and our Republican Secretary of the Environment sent a letter to House leadership last year describing how important the state's authority is to require conditions and FERC licenses that are necessary to protect water quality. The Conowingo Dam in Maryland, the hydroelectric dam, uh, is currently in the FERC relicensing process. That dam sits on the Susquehanna River, which provides half of the fresh water that reaches the Chesapeake Bay. Both the river and the dam are critical to the bay's water quality. So it's essential 
that Maryland retain the authority to protect the health of the bay and the coastal economies that depend on the bay by setting the necessary water quality conditions for Conowingo's FERC license. So we do talk a lot in this committee, and I think it's appropriate about the value of the knowledge that comes from local conditions and local communities. And I'd urge my colleagues, again, as we proceed, not to take water quality decisions out of the hands of the people who know those local communities and conditions best and are in the best position to work with the applicant and local communities to move the license forward. I'd ask unanimous consent, if I could, Mr. Chairman, to enter this letter from Secretary Grumbles um, uh, from Maryland into the record. Without objection. Thank you. And I yield back. Chairman yields back. Are there amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the question now occurs on forwarding the Hydropower Policy Modernization Act of 2017 to the full committee. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. You need a chair. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. And the bill is agreed to. Chair will now call up H.R. 2786 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 2786 to amend the Federal Power Act with respect to the criteria and process to qualify as a qualifying conduct hydropower facility. And without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with. The bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered, are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Mr. Or Chairman. Gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson. If uh, you would allow me to strike the last word. Strike the last word, gentlemen is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Rush. Thank you for holding today's important markup. I appreciate the subcommittee's consideration of this common sense legislation introduced by Representative DeGette and myself, focused on tapping our nation's immense conduit hydropower potential. Promoting this affordable source of clean electricity is important to our nation's all of the above energy strategy. Hydropower remains one of the most efficient and affordable sources of electricity, as well as one of the largest sources of renewable electricity in America. In North Carolina alone, it generates enough electricity to power 350,000 homes each year. Despite its benefits, hydropower's growth has been stagnant when compared to other renewable electricity sources in recent years. That lack of progress is not due to lack of opportunity. There are unnecessary regulatory burdens that simply clog up the dam. One key example is the overly complicated licensing process for conduit hydropower. This innovative class of hydropower harnesses the power of water flowing through man-made systems such as pipes and municipal water systems or irrigation canals. It produces emissions-free clean energy, improves energy diversity, lowers power bills, and creates jobs, all by making use of energy that would have otherwise been wasted. For this reason, conduit hydropower is often described as energy recovery hydropower. The opportunity is tremendous. There are over 1.2 million miles of water supply mains in the United States, creating literally thousands of energy recovery hydropower generation opportunities. But Congress must remove some of the regulatory roadblocks that inhibit this market-driven growth. That's exactly what our legislation will do. I'd like to again thank uh, Representative DeGette for her collaboration on this bipartisan bill. We've refined our bill after considering the feedback during last month's hearing uh, from the Federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission non-governmental organizations, and the hydropower industry. H.R. 2786 would build on the industry's lessons learned uh, from previous legislative success in 2013, the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act, and reduce the total re review process time for small-scale hydropower. It would also remove the capacity cap and allow more qualifying conduit projects to use the streamlined process. Reducing regulatory burdens is a common sense way to increase our nation's supply of clean and affordable electricity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for including our legislation on today's agenda. I look forward to working with you to advance this initiative through our committee. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Chair would recognize gentlemen from New Jersey. Strike the last word uh, for five minutes, Mr. Pallone. Well, actually, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment, so. Okay. Uh, gentlemen has, are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Seeing none, gentlemen uh, from New Jersey is, is uh, offered an amendment. The clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2786, offered by Mr. Pallone. And the uh, amendment will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, another bill in 2013, uh, our committee moved a bipartisan bill um, uh, that was sponsored by Representative McMorris-Rogers and Representative DeGette, 
that created an exemption from hydropower licensing for certain conduit hydropower facilities of five megawatts capacity or less. And under the process established in that McMorris Rogers to get bill, FERC must determine within 15 days after receipt of a notice of intent to construct a small conduit project by the developer if the project meets the qualifying criteria for exemption under the law. If FERC makes an initial determination that the project meets that criteria, current law requires FERC to publish a public notice of that determination and provide the public 45 days for an opportunity to comment on or contest FERC's determination. So that bill, previous, the previous bill, went on to be signed into law by President Obama and as of May has resulted in qualifying 83 projects being exempted from federal licensing requirements. Now the bill before us today, H.R. 2786, sponsored by Mr. Hudson and Ms. DeGette, would amend the Federal Power Act to lift the five megawatt cap on conduit projects that could qualify for exemption. And it also reduces from 45 to 15 days the amount of time the public would have to comment on or contest FERC's determination of whether a project qualifies for exemption. So I support the development of conduit hydroelectric projects and efforts to cut red tape to ensure that environmentally sound projects can move forward quickly and efficiently. And to that end, I also support language in the bill before us that removes the five megawatt cap in current law on the size of conduit hydro projects that qualify for the exemption. However, while I am open to modifying the 45-day time frame for public comment on a proposed exemption, I believe that 15 days is too short a period to allow for meaningful public input into the process, and that's why I'm proposing in this amendment a compromise that would reduce the amount of time for public notification by a third, from 45 days to 30 days. The amendment balances the interests of hydropower developers and that of the public. It's my understanding that the chairman intends to accept this amendment. I hope that's the case. And I would like this bill to go forward with the unanimous support of members on both sides of the aisle. And I believe the amendment I'm offering, if adopted, would ensure that outcome. So I hope, Mr. Chairman, that uh, my colleagues uh, on the other side will adopt the amendment and report the amended bill favorably to the If the gentleman will yield. I yield. Be delighted to accept the amendment. Make Thank a, you, sir. Make a good point, and I would urge my colleagues to support it. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote occurs on the amendment offered by Mr. Plone. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? If not, the question now occurs on forwarding H.R. 2786 as amended to the full committee. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the chair, the ayes have it. The bill as amended is agreed to. Chair now calls up the Enhancing State Energy Security Planning and Emergency Preparedness Act and asks the clerk to report. A discussion draft to amend the Energy Policy and Conservation Act to provide federal financial assistance to states to implement, review, and revise state energy security plans and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with. The bill will be open for any point, and I'd ask uh, to strike the last word and recognize myself for five minutes. The Enhancing State Energy Security Planning and Emergency Preparedness Act would strengthen states' abilities to secure our energy's energy infrastructure against physical and cyber attacks and would help mitigate the risk of energy supply disruptions. States are, in fact, leaders in recognizing the need to prioritize energy security, emergency preparedness, and energy infrastructure, infrastructure protection. And the committee understands that energy security planning is best carried out at the state level. No one is more familiar with the circumstances, risks, and vulnerabilities of local areas than the states. And throughout the entire process, the committee has worked hard to listen to the needs of the states. The committee received testimony from witnesses, including the National Association of State Energy Officials, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, along with several states, including Texas, Washington, Georgia, and obviously Michigan. We sincerely appreciate the perspectives that each of these witnesses provided on an energy security planning and emergency preparedness. The Department of Energy's State Energy Program was first authorized in the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, EPCA, back in 1975. 
The initial program provided federal and technical assistance to states who focused their efforts on energy conservation. In a 1990 amendment to EPCA expanded the scope and added energy emergency planning requirements as a supplement to state energy conservation plans. The authorization for the state energy program did expire in 2012, and the program has been receiving unauthorized appropriations ever since. Across the nation, states have to respond to a variety of hazards, including natural disasters such as hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, fuel supply disruptions, physical and cyber threats, and catastrophic events. The current state energy program's authorized purpose and scope does not fully address the risks and vulnerabilities of today's evolving energy landscape. It's been 25 years since we properly addressed energy security planning, and it is time for a legislative update. This bipartisan discussion draft reflects our commitment to support states' ongoing energy security planning efforts, yet still affords the flexibility that states have to have to address local energy challenges. This legislation continues the committee's extensive record focused on cyber preparedness, infrastructure resilience, and emergency response. I look forward to continued bipartisan discussions as we move forward in finalizing the bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Are there other members wishing to speak? Other members wishing to speak on the bill? Mr. Chairman, gentleman from Illinois. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm moving to strike the last. Strike the last word. He's recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I want to commend the majority for working with the minority on this particular piece of legislation. But again, Mr. Chairman, we would have preferred to follow regular order on this bill. As you know, many members on our side of the aisle support the state energy program. And this bill would provide resources to further develop and enhance the state energy security plans. Funding provided in this bill will help states to implement, revise, and review their energy security plans, while also laying out criteria for the contents of these bills. Although the subcommittee has not held a legislative hearing on this draft bill, I'm confident that if both sides continue to work together in good faith we can come to an agreement that will garner the overwhelming support of members from both sides of the aisle. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to continuing the discussions between the majority and the minority committee staff, and it is my hope and expectation that we will finalize a bill that will go a long way in helping states prepare plans to help mitigate for and respond to energy emergencies, whether they be natural or man-made, physical or cyber. Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman yield? I certainly will yield. I appreciate the gentleman's uh, comments, and I just want to give the assurance that we continue to work with both sides. This is a bipartisan effort. It has been from the very start. I uh, lament that we were not able to have a legislative hearing, but as we all know, last week we had the tragic shooting. Uh, and decided that we needed to cancel uh, our official duties uh, for that day. We had a number of witnesses that flew in from a variety of different states. Uh, because we did cancel the, the, the hearing itself, we still went ahead with a staff briefing that was, as I understand it, uh, bipartisan. Uh, and because of the importance of this issue, knowing that we've had some classified briefings as well, uh, we thought that it was important to use this window of opportunity uh, to move forward with the subcommittee mark uh, and allow us still time before it gets to full committee and, and ultimately to the House floor. But I just want to assure every member here that is one that does support regular order. Uh, this is an important issue, and it was only because of the tragedy last week uh, that we were forced to cancel the official legislative hearing. Uh, but as I understand it, a uh, number of different discussions we are all together on the same page, uh, wanting this legislation to move forward, and we'll continue to work uh, before it gets scheduled before the full committee. And I appreciate the gentleman's interest, his input, uh, and his sin uh, sincere effort to work with, with us uh, to get a bill that uh, we can pass on the House floor with broad bipartisan support. Um, I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I, I would claim my time. I just want to, whatever time I have now, I just want to really uh, understate 
or underline and, and reemphasize that we are absolutely dedicated to uh, the ongoing and longstanding principle of this subcommittee and that we do have regular order on the, the matters that are before the, the uh, subcommittee. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the bill? The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Like the last word? Yes, sir. Um, I want to reemphasize, Mr. Chairman, what you just said. Um, we were supposed to have a legislative hearing last Wednesday. Um, I was uh, inadvertently detained uh, out at the uh, baseball practice, and, and, and uh, I think at the time the hearing was supposed to have occurred, uh, I was uh, in an argument with the FBI trying to get my car out of the parking lot where the hearing occurred, so I couldn't have been here. But Which I, you lost that argument, didn't you? I did. I did lose that argument uh, very emphatically, actually. Um, but uh, I, I, I just want to reinforce your remarks and also let, as Mr. Rush knows, we try to be, and, and most of the time are, very bipartisan. And his staff, my staff, your staff, and Mr. McNerney's staff, is, as we, we are in ongoing discussions about uh, efforts to improve the bill uh, in its aspects of cybersecurity and things of that sort. So we didn't have the legislative markup, but if there was ever a legitimate reason to postpone it or cancel it, I think last week qualifies. And I also just want to commend Mr. Doyle for two things. He could not have been more gracious uh, last Wednesday in his uh, efforts to reach out to me uh, and all the Republicans on the baseball team. Uh, and I, I want to congratulate him for the victory uh, last Thursday. Uh, don't think that that's going to become a continuing thing, though, Mr. Doyle. We will be back next year. Uh, Mr. Shimkus, who is one of our players, played his 21st game, and he pitched a perfect inning last week, struck out two, so he may be our starting pitcher. If I can get him to come to a few more practices next year, uh, I'm going to have to negotiate with his agent on uh, what it's going to take to, to get him out. But he, he played exceptionally well. So anyway, we didn't have the legislative hearing because, as the chairman pointed out, there was something that had happened that was fairly, uh, fairly traumatic. Well, the gentleman, you. I'll be happy to yield. Uh, I just, you know, I don't want to quibble over this, but because uh, I understand the spirit in which he, <clears throat> both the gentleman from Texas and the chairman is uh, remarking on 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 this uh, uh, on this bill, but I want to remind the, uh, the chairman and the gentleman from Texas that uh, the hearing on Thursday was an over, oversight hearing. I'm it was not it was not a legislative hearing. As a matter I'm of talking fact, talking about last Wednesday. No, I, I understand, but I want to want you. My my point is that on Friday was the day that we actually got the meal. We didn't get the meal until Friday, so uh, I, I we all uh, were very concerned and fixated on the uh, uh, on the predicament of our colleague uh, and the. Uh, uh, the company of police officers and the members who were on the baseball team, and so, but I, we didn't get this meal until Friday of last week, so it would not. Sure, have yeah, that's that's you're correct. That's not a quibble, Mr. Uh, right. Ranking Member. That you're right about that. Right. You, okay. right. Now yield back. Right. Gentlemen, gentlemen, yields back. Other members, wish to speak. Seeing none. Other uh, bipartisan amendments to the bill. Seeing none, other amendments to the bill? Seeing none, question now occurs on 40 in the Enhancing State Energy Security Planning and Emergency Preparedness Act to the full committee. All those who are in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Senior Chair, the ayes have it, and the bill is forwarded on. Chair now calls up H.R. 2883 and asks the clerk to report. 
HR 2883 to establish a more uniform, transparent, and modern process to authorize the construction, connection, operation, and maintenance of international border crossing facilities for the import and export of oil and natural gas and the transmission of electricity. And without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered, are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Seeing none, are there any amendments? Further Mr. amendments to the bill? Mr. Gentleman <clears throat> from uh, New no. Jersey, Mr. Pallone has an amendment at the desk? Or, I, I have an amendment at the desk. Gentleman has an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the title. Um, amendment to HR 2883, offered by Mr. Pallone. And without objection, the amendment is the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment ensures that the complete length of cross-border projects would be subject to full environmental review under the National Environmental Policy Act. NEPA was created to provide transparency so people know what the impact of a project will be on their communities. However, the provisions of H.R. 2883 would circumvent that transparency, and that's why I've introduced this amendment, to include the entirety of a transboundary project and the definition of border crossing facility. By ensuring a federal NEPA review is conducted for the entire length of these projects, we can make certain that the necessary steps are taken to protect the public interest and preserve our tremendous natural resources. My amendment is necessary since the bill redefines and significantly narrows the scope of NEPA's environmental review. While traditional NEPA review looks at the impacts of an entire project, this bill restricts NEPA review to only that portion of a project that physically crosses the border. And this restriction, in my opinion, is problematic. These massive projects are more than just a border crossing. When we approve a transboundary pipeline or transmission line, we're approving multi-billion dollar infrastructure that may stretch hundreds of miles and will last for decades. These projects pass through private property and sensitive lands. They transport hazardous substances that have spilled or ignited can cause serious damage. Before making decisions about whether to approve such projects, we need to carefully consider their potential impacts on the environment and on communities along their routes. And simply put, we should be looking at the effects of projects as a whole. But that's not what the bill before us does. Instead, it redefines the scope of NEPA's inquiry to only encompass the step across the border. When Congress passed NEPA, it never intended this law to provide such a narrow review. Congress intended NEPA to provide policymakers with a critical tool to understand a project's full environmental impacts and consider lower impact alternatives. NEPA doesn't dictate the outcome or impose any constraint on projects. It simply requires the federal government to make some effort to understand the environmental impacts of major federal actions and to inform the public of those impacts. Fundamentally, NEPA requires us to look before we leap, which is just common sense. We should not be carelessly narrowing or creating loopholes in this law. When the federal government makes a decision about a major project, it should understand what's going on. Large energy projects often raise safety issues, economic implications, and environmental concerns both for the local and global environments. These projects affect communities all along their routes. Ignoring the impacts will not make them disappear. It's simply common sense that we should understand the broad scope of these impacts before deciding to approve a project. And that's why I urge all my colleagues to support this important amendment that ensures that the complete length of cross-border projects will be subject to a full NEPA review. And I yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Chair would recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And why I uh, greatly have respect for the ranking member Plone. I do want to point out a couple of things. First thing, this legislation has absolutely nothing in it that would repeal environmental protection uh, that is already applicable to pipelines, or it will hinder in any way the ability of federal agencies or states to carry out their statutory responsibilities. So we're not making any changes to any environmental study. All this bill does is simply remove the process out for excuses. Uh, we've seen uh, too long the Keystone Pipeline that was being used as an excuse and layers of red tape was put in there. So this legislation defines border crossing facility to mean the portion of the pipeline that is located at the international boundary only. Uh, 
Um, this amendment would try to expand the definition of the border crossing facility to, to include the entire length of the pipeline, which would infringe on the state's rights to receive and decide the impacts of the other portions of the pipeline. This bill has been carefully crafted with bipartisan support to be protective uh, of public safety and the environment. This amendment would upset this careful balance that we have had with bipartisan support and effectively gut this bill. So I would urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, yield. Yes, I would yield to Mr. Green. Thank you. Um, we had this bill last Congress and we requested a uh, uh, Congressional Research Service and I'd be glad to hand out the copies based on the last, and I think the language is the same in this bill as it was for the last one, if my colleagues would like to see a copy of what the CRS talked about. Before a federal agency can make a final decision on proposed action, NEPA requires that the agency identify the proposal's effects on the quality of human environment. The scope and level of review required under NEPA depends on whether these effects will be significant. To make that determination, each agency must identify and evaluate the proposal. This bill doesn't change that. Uh, there will still be a NEPA process, not just at the cross border, uh, uh, the crossing the border, but also along the route, it will trigger a NEPA process. Uh, the amendment, I don't think is necessary. Um, I think it'll already be covered because, uh, again, I'm familiar with the border of Texas and the pipelines. Um, there will not be a pipeline that goes into Mexico that doesn't cross some federal property a wildlife refuge or something else that will trigger uh, a NEPA review. So uh, I am I can't say that about the Canadian border, maybe my colleagues from Northern, but, uh, but this bill does not take away uh, any NEPA uh, oversight that's currently in the law. And I appreciate my colleague from Oklahoma. Uh, I'll quit for about a day complaining you're still taking our football players. Yeah. And I'll would, yield uh, back. would the gentleman from Oklahoma yield to me? Uh, yes. Um, I want to reinforce what you just said. The whole point of this bill is to put into statute uh, to replace an ambiguous non-statutory certification process by the president, which is just kind of happenstance, really. And so what Mr. Green and Mr. Mullen are trying to do is, is put in clear statute a simple, understandable, uh, time certain process, if we accepted Mr. Pallone's amendment, uh, as Mark Wayne pointed out, you would basically gut the bill. So I, I want to reinforce the opposition. I also want to take point of personal privilege. We've talked a lot about the members and people that were at the baseball practice last week that when the shooting occurred. At the back of the room, we have a um, uh, gentleman named Brian Kelly. He's at the very back left-hand corner, he's the Republican umpire and he hits fungos to the outfield and is just a, a volunteer who comes out and helps us. Uh, last week, he risked his life. He came behind where the Capitol Hill police were and was direct, they couldn't see the shooter and Brian actually risked his body to see where the shooter was and direct the Capitol Hill officers to where the shooter was shooting uh, at the members. If he'll stand up, we should recognize him. He's one of the unsung heroes and a, a tremendously good guy. And with that, I yield back to Mark Wayne. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Minutes. Speaker, uh, and I yield my five my time to uh, the ranking member. Oh, th thank you, Mr. McNeary. I, I don't. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but you know, I, I looked at the um, CRS uh, memo that uh, Mr. Green uh, just provided, and my concern is, is not, and the reason for this amendment is not alleviated, in my opinion, by this memo because. Um, there's really no guarantee that if you limit the scope of the review under the uh, existing bill to just that section that crosses the border, uh, there's no guarantee that, um, that NEPA is going to look beyond that and look at the whole project. And even though, uh, I mean, looking at this memo, it doesn't in any way suggest that um, that, that guarantee would be there. 
I mean, I guess there's nothing to stop NEPA from looking at other things, but um, they wouldn't be under any charge or any requirement to do that uh, under, the, under the bill. And so that's why it's necessary to, uh, to have the amendment to specify that they would look at the entire project and not just that section that crosses the border. And with that, I uh, yield back to Mr. McNearney. And I'll yield back to the yield back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? See, gentlelady from Florida, Castro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to urge adoption of the Pallone Amendment, which would substantially improve this bill, uh, H.R. 2883. 2883 proposes to eliminate meaningful review of all environmental impacts of proposed cross-border energy projects. The bill narrowly, uh, dramatically narrows the scope of environmental review to only the cross-border segment of the energy project, the tiny portion that physically crosses the national boundary. That's very poor public policy, and it significantly contravenes important safeguards and the public interest. We're talking about major infrastructure projects that can span hundreds of miles. They cross through private property, through water bodies, farms, and other sensitive areas, and they carry substances that can catch fire or spill or pollute the environment. And they can have profound implications for the changing climate and all of the huge cost that are now being imposed upon families and businesses. Uh, to understand the potential environmental impact of an energy project, you must look at the project as a whole. To ignore the potential environmental or safety risks for every part of the project except for the tiny sliver of land at the national boundary is irresponsible. Imagine going to the doctor if you're feeling sick and the doctor says, I'm giving you a clean bill of health after only looking at your elbow. That's what this bill does. It lets these projects go forward without a full environmental review. And no meaningful review means no opportunity to mitigate potential harm to the public health, public safety, or the environment, and that's just reckless. And I think this will have the opposite effect of what is intended. I think you will probably see more lawsuits, uh, more protests, greater delays, and uh, again, that would be just the opposite of what is intended. Uh, Mr. Plone's amendment would ensure that these cross-border energy projects receive a thorough environmental review before they receive approval, and I urge adoption of the amendment. And yield back my time. And lady yields back. Are the members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote occurs on the, on the uh, amendment offered by the gentleman from New Jersey. Re roll call vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. All those in favor of the amendment will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. Mr. Olson. No. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes no. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Long. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Bouchon votes no. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores votes no. Mr. Mullen. Mr. Mullen votes no. Mr. Hudson. Mr. Hudson votes no. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Kramer votes no. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. McNer Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters votes aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Aye. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Lobsack. Mr. Lobsack votes aye. Mr. Schrader. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. 
Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Chairman Upton. Votes no. Chairman Upton votes no. How does Mr. Uh, Shimkus vote? Mr. Shimkus votes no. Other members wishing to change their vote or to vote? If seeing none, the clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 12 ayes and 18 noes. 12 ayes, 18 noes. The, vote, the amendment is not agreed to. Uh, are there other further amendments to the bill? The, gentleman, the chair will recognize the gentleman from Illinois to offer an amendment. <clears throat> Mr. Ross. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. And the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2883, offered by Mr. Rush. And the amendment will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my amendment will simply retain the current requirement that the permitting agency must find that a project is in the public interest before the project is approved. Mr. Chairman, the stated objective of H.R. 2883 is to, I quote, uh, is to establish a more uniform, transparent, and modern process to authorize the construction, connection, operation, and maintenance of international water crossing facilities for the import and export of oil and natural gas and the transmission of electricity, end of quote. However, Mr. Chairman, H.R. 2883 appears to me less about expediting the permit, permitting process for, for cross-border pipelines and transmission lines, and more about creating a de facto rubber stamp for these projects. Mr. Chairman, this bill tips the scales in favor of an automatic approval in two key ways. First, the new process established by the bill effectively exempts such projects from environmental safety and review under the national, under NEPA, by narrowing NEPA applicability to the just the portion of the project actually crossing the border. Additionally, the process created by the bill also tips the scale in favor of approving controversial projects by establishing a rebuttable presumption of approval. Mr. Chairman, the existing process requires an agency to affirmatively, affirmatively find that a project is in the public interest, but instead this bill shifts the burden of proof to opponents of the project to demonstrate otherwise. In fact, H.R. 2883 will allow a project that was found not to be in the public interest under the current permitting process to reapply under the new weaker process. Mr. Chairman, these massive cross-border energy projects could have a significant impact on people's lives, and we owe it to the American people to make a real effort to understand those impacts before deciding whether or not to approve an application. Using information developed under NEPA, the current public interest standard allows all of the relevant potential effects of a project to be considered and mitigated where possible and where appropriate. But I'm concerned that the bill's new permitting provision will actually make the process worse, less transparent, less inclusive, and ultimately less, far less effective. Mr. Chairman, this bill will drastically narrow what can be considered in evaluating these projects, and together with the 120-day time limit imposed in the bill, these provisions basically require the 
permitting agencies to rubber stamp all cross-border projects. Mr. Chairman, despite the intended objective of this bill, by narrowing the scope of NEPA, limiting public participation, and shifting the burden of determining public interest, this bill may actually lead to greater controversy, increased litigation, and lower delays. With that said, Mr. Chairman, I urge all of my colleagues to support my amendment. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back, and I would ask to strike the, the last word. I would, I would uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, I would argue that the underlying Bill 2883 actually would establish a more uniform, transparent, and modern process to authorize the construction of pipelines and electric transmission facilities at, literally at the border. Canada and Mexico are two of our most trusted allies and trading partners, and unless there is a good reason to believe that trade with these countries is for some reason not in the national interest, border crossing facilities should be approved. We actually have a long-standing precedent for a rebuttable presumption in favor of trade with our allies. The Natural Gas Act, for example, contains the very same standard of review language is the same. So this amendment would gut the bill, uh, and I would urge my colleagues to vote no on the amendment and yield back the Mr. balance Chairman, of my time. Mr. Chairman, would you yield? Uh, yield I, I yield then to the gentleman from Texas. Thank you. Um, this amendment, I think, uh, because of rebuttable presumption, we have a free trade agreement with our two borders. We're not going to build pipelines to uh, Cuba. Uh, we're not going to build pipelines anywhere except Canada or Mexico. We have a free trade agreement, and that's why the, uh, the rebuttable presumption. Now, I have to admit, in 1993, I did not vote for NAFTA. But I think over a period of time, we can change it. But uh, the success of what's happening on the Texas border now is uh, Mexico needs our natural gas. And to per get there, the permitting process has been a struggle, and, uh, but just because of what the experience of Keystone. And so that's why we're trying to uh, make sure that between a, a free trading partner that we have, that decision on rebuttal presumption is always made when Congress approved uh, these free trade agreements. And so that's why I think we're just putting into the law what should be common sense, that if you have a free trade agreement with someone, you ought to make it a rebuttable presumption. It's, not, it's in the national interest, because that's why. And thank you for yielding to me. All right. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Gentleman from, Ms. from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to speak in support of Mr. Rush's amendment. I, um, I was listening to your remarks about our uh, great relationship with Mexico and, um, and uh, Canada. I'm not so sure that's true anymore with, uh, with President Trump, but whatever. Hope springs eternal. Um, H.R. 2883 establishes a new permitting process that appears to have one goal, ensuring rapid approval of cross-border energy projects. The bill makes it very difficult for federal agencies to do anything other than approve the proposed projects for two reasons. First, based on reason for my uh, initial amendment, is the new permitting process narrows the federal approval and environmental review to just the cross-border portion of the proposed project and this eliminates consideration of the concerns that stem from the project as a whole. And then second, the reason for Mr. Rush's amendment is that the bill establishes a rebuttable presumption of approval, meaning that the federal agency must approve the project unless it finds that the cross-border segment of the project is not in the public interest. So that is a major change. And uh, it's not a subtle change, a significant change that makes it much more likely that these projects will be approved even if the record is incomplete. To put it another way, this bill effectively says that all oil and natural gas pipelines and electricity transmission lines that cross the U.S. border are always in the public interest. And to prove otherwise, federal agencies can only consider the impacts of these projects at the narrow segment that crosses the border. That's an extremely high bar to meet. And for what? To guarantee that every project has the green light, regardless of the merits? We should keep in mind that the purpose of the current presidential permit requirement is to ensure that when a private company plans to build a massive infrastructure project across the U.S. border, the executive branch has a chance to evaluate the project. 
The purpose is to ensure that we understand the project's potential effects on foreign policy, trade, the economy, the environment, public health and safety, and other factors. And the purpose is also to address any unacceptable effects through permit conditions or denial, if necessary. But the process established in this bill would only serve the purpose of approving all projects more quickly. By shifting the burden of proof to require a showing that the project is contrary to the public interest and sharply narrowing the focus of that inquiry, this bill makes it extremely difficult for an agency ever to deny a permit. And that's not something that I can support and I don't think we should support. So I'm glad Mr. Rush is offering this amendment today and I urge a yes vote. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote occurs on the amendment. A recorded vote is asked. Uh, the, uh, on the amendment, uh, the clerk will call the roll on the Rush Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed say no. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Olson. No. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes no. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Long. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores votes no. Mr. Mullen. No. Mr. Mullen votes no. Mr. Hudson. Mr. Hudson votes no. Mr. Kramer. No. Mr. Kramer votes no. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Rush. Aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. McNerney. <laughs> Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters votes aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Aye. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Loebsack. Mr. Loebsack votes aye. Mr. Schrader. Mr. Schrader? Mr. Schrader votes aye. Mr. Kennedy? Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Butterfield? Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Mr. Pallone? Mr. Pallone votes aye. Chairman Upton? Votes no. Chairman Upton votes no. How is Mr. Walden recorded? Mr. Walden is not recorded. Mr. Walden votes no. How is Mr. Bouchon recorded? Mr. Bouchon is not recorded. Mr. Bouchon votes no. Other members wishing to change the vote or cast a vote? Seeing none, clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 13 ayes and 18 noes. 13 ayes, 18 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the vote occurs on forwarding H.R. 2883 to the full committee. A uh, recorded vote has been asked for. All those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed vote no. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Olson. Aye. Mr. Olson votes aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes aye. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes aye. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes aye. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes aye. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes aye. Mr. Long. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Bouchon votes aye. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores votes aye. Mr. Mullen. Mr. Mullen votes aye. Mr. Hudson. Mr. Hudson votes aye. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Kramer votes aye. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes aye. Mr. Rush. No. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes no. Mr. Peters. 
Mr. Peters votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Tonko. No. Mr. Tonko votes no. Mr. Lobsack. Nope. Mr. Lobsack votes no. Mr. Schrader. Mr. Schrader votes aye. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy votes no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes no. Mr. Pallone. Yes. Mr. Pallone votes no. Chairman Upton. Votes aye. Chairman Upton votes aye. Other members wishing to change their vote or cast a vote? Seeing none, clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 12 ayes and 19 no. Sorry. There were, Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 19 ayes and 12 no's. 19 ayes and 12 no's. The, the, uh, the question on 40 and 2883 is uh, approved uh, and forwarded to the full committee. The chair will now call up H.R. 2910 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 2910. To provide for federal and state, excuse me, to provide for federal and state agency coordination in the approval of certain authorizations under the National Natural Gas Act and for other purposes. And without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. Are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Seeing none, are there any amendments to the bill? Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Illinois has an amendment in, uh, at the desk. Yes, I have and an the amendment. The clerk will report the title of the amendment. What amendment? What amendment number is it? Do you know? What's the amendment number is it? Three. 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 I'm told it's three. Amendment to HR 2910, offered by Mr. Rush. And the amendment will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my amendment was simply strike section four of the mill. H.R. 2910 is a mill that offers a solution in search of a problem. Just last month, the subcommittee heard testimony from Director Terry Turpin of FERC's Office of Energy Projects, in which he stated that 88% of applications are currently processed within 12 months. Additionally, Director Turpin noted that the number one reason for an application being delayed was due to the licensee failing to provide FERC and other agencies with a, quote, timely and complete information necessary to perform congressionally mandated project reviews, in a quote. Mr. Chairman, instead of actually addressing the main reason causing the delays for the 12% of applications that take over 12 months to approve, H.R. 2910 seeks to cut corners in a variety of ways and substitutes safety with expediency. Mr. Chairman, while we all understand the need for an expanded energy infrastructure, it is extremely important to our constituents that these pipelines be constructed in a way that protects the environment and offers a sense of security to the communities which they traverse. Congress should not make it easier for private entities to claim in imminent domain and potentially negatively impact historical and cultural sites, aquifers, farms, and other private properties, while at the same time limiting the ability for states, for tribes, and for local communities to provide input into the process. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, H.R. 2910 does exactly that. This bill will cut corners by allowing incomplete applications to be considered. The bill will also cut corners by allowing incomplete data 
from aerial surveys to be considered in the application process. This bill will cut corners by minimizing the input of states and agencies responsible for protecting the environment, sensitive lands, aquifers, and other natural resources. Mr. Chairman, this bill allows FERC to determine which agencies are deemed relevant to the application process, and if a state or, or agency is not deemed relevant to the process by FERC, then those stakeholders are completely shut out of the process. In fact, this bill would specifically pro prohibit non-designation agencies, including state organizations, from being able to, I quote, request or conduct a NEPA review that is supplemental to the project-related rela review conducted by the commission, end of quote. This bill will also prohibit, quote, non-designation non agencies from including comments or supplemental information into the record. Mr. Chairman, as we have seen in the, in the past and continue to witness today, the issue of constructing these pipelines through aquifers, private property, cultural sites, and other sensitive lands is an issue that causes great public consternation and public outcry. We should, bring, we should be taking into account the sensitive nature of this issue by listening to our constituents and making them feel as though we have more of a voice in these sometimes very difficult decisions, not trying to limit their input. Mr. Chairman, I would urge all of my colleagues to support my amendment striking Section 4 of the bill so that states, tribes, and local community stakeholders can continue to play an important role in the pipeline permitting process. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman is back. Uh, anyone want to speak in opposition to the amendment? Mr. Chairman, I move to direct the last word. Mr. Floyd is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the interest of time, I waive my opening comments regarding my bill. Um, but I'll go ahead and talk about what the bill does because I think my bill was mischaracterized pretty dramatically in that uh, statement regarding this amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, America is one of the world's top oil and gas producers thanks to the Shell Revolution. Our energy infrastructure and permitting processes must be updated to reflect America's abundance of domestic energy resources. Modernizing the permitting process for our nation's pipeline infrastructure allows us to efficiently and safely bring those resources to our downstream assets, ultimately to consumers, to power our economy, and to give opportunities for hardworking American families. H.R. 2910, promoting interagency coordination for review of Natural Gas Pipelines Act, builds important permit reforms under the Energy Policy Act of 2005 by bringing greater accountability, predictability, and transparency to the process for interstate pipelines. This bill requires early notification to all participating agencies, all states, and all affected Indian tribes to lessen the burden of interagency bureaucracy and it reinforces FERC's status as the lead agency. It further establishes a process for consultation and concurrent reviews among federal and state agencies, Indian tribes, and sets deadlines for final decisions. H.R. 29 and 10 includes common sense reforms, including codifying some of the commission's existing practices into statute. It's important to note that this process is more transparent and more accountable, and this bill enhances certainty for pipeline applicants. This bill does not guarantee a given outcome for any applicant. It does, however, ensure that the involved agencies follow their duty to act on appropriate projects and not push an ideological agenda by using delays and stall, taxi, stall tactics. Expanding and modernizing our infrastructure brings additional benefits of creating jobs and means lower energy prices for hardworking American families. Now, I want to go th in term and particular response to the amendment that's been offered by the gentleman. Again, I want to say H.R. 10 encourages agencies to participate in the environmental review process. It cuts no corners, and this leads to better, more informed decision-making. 
This amendment would do the complete opposite. It would discourage agencies from participating. It would lead to confusion. It would lead to duplication. It would lead to delay. The need for new natural gas infrastructure is clear. It presents new opportunities for our economy and jobs. It strengthens our energy security and reduces our domestic emissions. Now, one of the things that the, the gentleman said that sponsored the amendment, he said that 80% of the applications are, are on time, are timely issued. Okay, that's true. <laughs> that means that 20% are late, and that 20% re represents a substantial increase from just a few years ago. Now, these delays and that 20% don't come without a cost. And so here are some examples. Uh, Project A, I'm going to use an example. It cost an additional $54 million versus an original $607 million budget, which was over a 10% increase. Project B, as an example, was supposed to cost about $683 million, but the uh, projected loss of revenues due to the delays from the, the lack of coordination among the bureaucracies and the addi additional cost due to unbudgeted and duplicated regulatory process was $118 million. In other words, total increased cost or lost revenues of $691 million versus a $683 million project, two times the original cost. Project C was supposed to cost $2.56 billion, but the delays and, um, and, and uh, bureaucratic overrun, bureaucratic uh, delay, uh, bureaucratic cost cost an additional half billion dollars or 20% increase. So that 20%, the 20% that are delayed, which again is way up, has a cost to our economy, it has a cost on American jobs, and it delays these important uh, projects. So I urge a no vote on the amendment and a yes vote on the underlying bill. Thank you, I yield back. Gentlemen, it's back. The chair now calls upon the ranking member for an announcement. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I want to, uh, Tiffany, uh, staff uh, here on this side, she created an uproar because she, her water broke during this a hearing, and so she's rushing home and possibly going to the hospital to have a baby. So, yeah. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. I, I hope she has extended paternal leave so we might be able to get things done because she's a tough, <laughs> she's a tough negotiator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, is there statements in support of the amendment? <laughs> Chair now calls upon the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, she actually kept talking, even though she was supposed to go to the hospital. I said, would you please get out of here? So she finally, I'm shocked she kept talking. I'm shocked. She finally left. <laughs> anyway, Mr. Chairman, I do want to speak in support of the Rush Amendment. Um, the section of the bill in question would have set up a, a new, more limited role for agencies not designated by FERC as participating agencies in the authorization process. This is an important distinction as any agency not designated as participating would be greatly limited in their ability to participate in the project review process. And these agencies would be prohibited from requesting or conducting a supplemental NEPA review. Further, the bill would also prohibit FERC from considering any comments provided by these agencies during a project's NEPA review, or even allow FERC to include any of their comments in the record of the review. While the underlying intent of this provision remains unclear, it appears to be nothing more than an explicit attempt to weaken environmental protections and silence potential critics of certain projects. As written, this section of the bill would allow FERC to rather arbitrarily define which agencies are allowed to be involved in the review process while gagging others. And in, in doing so, it would provide FERC with a mechanism to further limit public and state participation in the licensing process. Natural gas projects are often massive in scale, affecting numerous property owners, surrounding communities, and the environment. And while I heard uh, the Republican sponsor talk about additional costs, you know, I mean, the bottom line is that these are major projects that could have real problems. And so, I, I understand your concern about additional costs, but we do have to make sure uh, that they're not causing uh, any potential damage. Because of the magnitude of their potential impact, we should be welcoming, not silencing input from diverse stakeholders. Now, my Republican colleagues might argue that by limiting participation in the NEPA review, we can streamline and shorten the timeline for project approval. But there's no evidence to suggest that the approval process takes too long in the first place. 
As many have said, and as representatives of FERC have testified, nearly 90% of all new projects are, certif are certi uh, certificated within one year. And with numbers like that, it's hard not to argue that the current review and approval framework is working just fine, in my opinion. So I support the amendment to strike the language in question and urge my colleagues to do the same. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone want to speak in opposition to the amendment? Does anyone want to speak in support of the amendment? Mr. Tonko from New York, recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to strike the last word. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to pose a clarifying question to Council. On page 9, line 14, the new text states, and I quote, if such application is sufficiently complete for the purposes of commencing consideration. Um, can staff please explain what a sufficiently complete application may or may not include? There's no definition of sufficiently complete. It would be left to the discretion of the agency involved. So, in other words, it would be res the responsibility of that agency to decide if an application is sufficiently complete, without Correct. firm guidance in, in in language in this uh, in this bill. So, who would that agency? We'd be relying on FERC then. It would be the agency that's involved in issuing the federal authorization. So then would FERC evaluate this on a case-by-case -case basis, or is there existing guidance on what cons constitutes a sufficiently complete application? It would be up to the agency to determine whether or not the application is sufficiently complete for the purposes of commencing consideration. Mr. Chairman, I don't think this language is sufficiently drafted. There are too many ambiguities. We're asking FERC to make an undefined determination. Frankly, most of this bill is a solution in search of a problem. We've heard from FERC that 88% of projects are certified within one year following a completed application. And yes, I believe it's incumbent on project developers to file completed applications before complaining that the process is too slow. But I truly believe that some of these projects are necessary and in the public good, but there's not good evidence that we need to further tilt the process in favor of pipeline companies, which is what the proposed expediting process would do. Take, for instance, the remote survey section on page 11. Uh, F2, we heard testimony that aerial data have limitations and can be insufficient. These data may not account for historic sites, endangered species, or wetlands, but under this bill, agencies would be required to consider it. This bill does not include any standards or methodology uh, requirements that must be met in order for an agency to be required to consider data from remote surveys. So state and federal agencies may be forced to consider very shoddy, unreliable data without quality control requirements that might consider the degree of accuracy, scale, elevation, and many other factors. Granting conditional permits based on inadequate data will ultimately not speed up the process, but it will enable the rights of landowners uh, being circumvented. Applicants would not need to make a good faith attempt to gain access to a private property owner's land, and in so doing, help to make an important stakeholder aware that this project is being developed. Streamlining is fine, but we're talking about a process that can result in the use of eminent domain authority. The bar for seizing private property should be high. Historically, it has been. Is, is it in the public's interest? But this bill is helping to shift the question to, is it in the company's interest? And that is not acceptable to me. I would encourage my colleagues to oppose this bill and to support the amendments. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Is there any members seeking to speak in opposition to the amendment? Seeing none, is there a member who wants to speak in support of the amendment? The question now occurs on affording H.R. 29. Oh, the question now occurs on the Rush Amendment. All those in favor say aye. A roll call vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Olson. No. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes no. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Griffith. 
Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Long. Mr. Bouchon. No. Mr. Bouchon votes no. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores votes no. Mr. Mullen. Mr. Mullen votes no. Mr. Hudson. No. Mr. Hudson votes no. Mr. Kramer. No. Mr. Kramer votes no. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters votes aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Aye. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Lobsack. Mr. Lobsack votes aye. Mr. Schrader. Mr. Schrader votes aye. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Chairman Upton. Votes no. Chairman Upton votes no. Other members wishing to change the vote or cast the vote? Seeing none, the clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 14 ayes and 17 noes. 14 ayes, 17 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? Gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Pallone has the amendment at the desk. Which number? It says 01, Mr. Chairman. 01. And the clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment to HR 2910, offered by Mr. Pallone. And the amendment will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment would strike the remote survey section of the bill, which places aerial survey data on the same footing with on-the-ground survey data for the purposes of the pipeline siting review process. Pipeline companies have been utilizing drones and other aircraft to survey private property more regularly in recent years. And this is problematic for a number of reasons. First, aerial survey data may not be able to accurately identify waterways that are present in the project area, particularly in heavily forested areas where tree cover may obscure a water body. Aerial surveys are similarly inadequate when it comes to identifying the potential impact on endangered species that may be present in the project area. And further, this bill appears to be an effort to sidestep the rights of private landowners and local governments who have barred pipeline companies from surveying on their property. There are important reasons why FERC and other federal agencies must utilize on-the-ground survey data to determine whether a gas pipeline can be constructed in a safe manner that minimizes impacts on local communities. And while I understand FERC does not accept aerial data, I'm sorry, while I understand FERC does accept aerial data, not all federal and state agencies involved in this process feel that these remote surveys are sufficient. In my opinion, one of the main motives for this provision is to give companies the ability to move through a significant portion of the application process without property owners having knowledge of their property being surveyed and reviewed for a pipeline route. Under this provision, it is possible that a property owner would not have knowledge that a company was evaluating their property for the purposes of a natural gas pipeline route until very late in the process, when opportunities to intervene are more limited. This has been happening, actually, in my home state of New Jersey, where the Penn East pipeline has been proposed, and homeowners have reported the company surveying their property by air without notification or consent. Property owners deserve to know if a company is planning to survey their property by air and if this data is going to be used to advance an application at FERC to site a pipeline on their property. And at the very minimum, the applicant should be required to obtain consent from the property owner. So I urge my colleagues to support this important amendment, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. Chair, I would recognize the gentleman from Texas to speak on the amendment. Mr. Track, last word. So be it. I uh, want to oppose the amendment and uh, request that our colleagues vote against the amendment. Uh, FERC is the lead agency for siting international, excuse me, interstate natural gas pipelines. Uh, 
Uh, but there are a number of other federal and state agencies that must issue, must issue uh, permits for large-scale proj uh, projects. And the, through the uh, FERC pre-file process, sponsors engage with landowners, local communities, and government agencies to educate stakeholders and collect information about the best location for siting the pipeline. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, log jams occur in the process. For example, under the Clean Water Act, a special permit is required to cross streams or wetlands. However, before the Corps issues their permits, they may require the applicant to survey the area. Sometimes the landowner denies access to the site, leaving the applicant uh, process stuck. So H.R. 2910 specifies that agencies considering an aspect of a FERC application can utilize information gathered by remote aerial surveys with the condition that the data will be verified by subsequent on-site inspections. Remote aerial surveys are widely accepted. They're a proven method of collecting environmental information. Allowing remote surveys would improve the environmental review and eliminate potential uh, for unnecessary delays. Allowing remote surveys would give agencies access to more information. More information leads to better decisions. I don't see how anybody can argue with that. And just so we're clear, here's the language that the gentleman's proposing to strike, starting with line eight on page 11. Remote surveys, if a federal or state agency considering an aspect of an application for federal authorization requires the person applying for such authorization to submit data, the agency shall consider any such data gathered by aerial or other remote means that the person submits. The agency may grant a conditional approval for the federal authorization based on the data gathered by aerial or remote means conditioned upon the verification of such data by subsequent on-site inspection. So uh, we haven't really done anything except provide for additional information on a conditional basis, uh, which would be backed up by subsequent on-site data. So I, I urge a no vote because I believe the gentleman's amendment is, a, is uh, not needed at this point. Thank you. Would the gentleman yield? Sure, I'll just yield back, but go ahead. I, I'm not arguing that um, you wouldn't have to have verification on ground eventually. The problem though, and this is what we face in New Jersey, is that um, the, there's no notification of the aerial. And so oftentimes the property owners, in this case, particularly with the Penn East pipeline, the survey is done by air and they don't know anything about it until, very, until the very end of the process uh, because there's no notification of the aerial survey. And so as a consequence, the landowner or the local government has very little time to actually you know, provide any input. That's, that's what we're facing right now. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Recl thank you, reclaiming my time. But again, through the FERC pre-file process, sponsors engage with the landowners, local communities, and government agencies to educate their stakeholders and collect information about the best location for signing the pipeline. So this doesn't wind up as a big surprise to most landowners. I yield back. Gentlemen yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendments? Chairman. Gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to speak and support on the Pallone Amendment. The bill before us today will allow the use of survey data collected by aerial or other remote means in the federal authorization process for natural gas project applications. My Republican colleagues argue that the use of such data in lieu of ground surveys would speed up the approval process for, constru for construction of new pipelines. In fact, the use of aerial data may very well have the opposite effect. Aerial data would still need to be verified with the survey data collected on site. Pipeline routes may well have to be changed even after initial approval if area data cannot be verified. This could result in lengthy construction delays while wasting already precious resources in the process. Beyond such delays, I have other serious reservations about the use of aerial and other remote surveys in the application and the authorization process. The use of area surveys is bad for the environment. With area surveys, it is difficult to assess the presence of endangered plants and wildlife. It could 
it can also be difficult to identify certain types of sensitive and protected ecosystems, while like wetlands. <clears throat> Area and remote surveys also bad for property owners. Use of such data would effectively strip landowners as well as the local agencies of their ability to participate, participate meaningfully in the pipeline siting process. Make no mistake, Mr. Chairman, approving the use of area survey data for authorization of new gas projects will only serve to diminish the rights of property owners. I'm sure we can all agree that natural gas projects need to be planned, approved, and developed using the best available data. Data from aerial and remote surveys are simply too limited and flawed to meet this goal. I strongly support the amendment to strike this language from the bill and urge all of my constituents to do the same. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none. The vote occurs on the amendment offered by the um, uh, roll call is requested. Those in favor of the Rush Amendment will vote aye. Those opposed right, will vote no. Pallone Amendment. Pallone Amendment. I'm sorry, the Pallone Amendment. Uh, those in favor of the Pallone Amendment, vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. And the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Olson. No. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. Barton. No. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes no. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Long. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Bouchon votes no. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores votes no. Mr. Mullen. Mr. Mullen votes no. Mr. Hudson. Mr. Hudson votes no. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Kramer votes no. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters votes aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Lobsack. Mr. Lobsack votes aye. Mr. Schrader. Mr. Schrader votes aye. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Chairman Upton. Votes no. Chairman Upton votes no. Members wishing to change the vote or cast a vote? Seeing none, the clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there are 14 ayes and 17 noes. 14 ayes, 17 noes. The amendment offered by the gentleman from New Jersey is not accepted. Are there further amendments to the bill? Gentlelady from Florida has an amendment. I have an amendment at the desk D04 called Avoiding Wasteful Government Spending. Clerk will report the title of the bill. Amendment to H.R. 2910 offered by Ms. Castor. And the amendment will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment and the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes in support of her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members, the bill before us today uh, aims to expedite the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission review of natural gas pipeline applications. Now, despite the fact that 90 percent of FERC natural gas pipeline projects are approved within one year, I do understand the desire for FERC and other agencies to be as efficient as possible. Uh, and I'm not the only one that feels this way. Earlier this month, the White House set up a new council to help, help project managers navigate the bureaucratic maze, saying that their council will also improve transparency by creating a new online dashboard, allowing everyone to easily track major projects 
through every stage of the approval process. Now, I've raised this issue before uh, that this bill is redundant and unnecessary because I'm sure all members recall that in 2015, in the overwhelmingly bipartisan FAST Act that was signed into law, the Congress directed the executive branch to set up the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council, uh, or we call it FIPSI, to improve timeliness, predictability, and transparency of federal environmental review and authorization process for major infrastructure projects, including interstate national, uh, natural gas pipelines. The council is now uh, getting organized. It will oversee permitting for over 30 major infrastructure projects that and benefit, will all benefit from enhanced coordination, including establishment of a lead agency for the project, recommended performance schedules, and public project timelines, and greater transparency at all levels of review. It turns out that the White House pronouncement and the FIPSI are the exact same council. And taking all of that into account, the bill before us is unnecessary and redundant. Uh, increased coordination and transparency for infrastructure permitting is already covered by FIPSI. Uh, so let's not add another layer here by adopting this bill. Uh, the committee would have benefited from testimony from PIP FIPSI on any possible redundancies with H.R. 2910. However, the majority did not invite FIPSI to testify on this bill, despite requests to hold additional hearings so members could hear about their progress so far. Uh, so to eliminate this wasteful duplication, my amendment requires OMB to determine that the bill does not duplicate any existing federal efforts to improve the timeliness, predictability, and transparency of the federal environmental review and authorization process, uh, and doesn't result in wasteful government spending. This is just an exercise in good government. Uh, if my Republican colleagues won't solicit input from federal agencies while drafting legislation, then taxpayers should not have to pay for their mistakes. If the provisions of this bill are unique, then the act will go forward as is. Uh, but if OMB finds that these transparency and streamlining functions are already being done elsewhere, then the unnecessary and wasteful bill will not go into effect. Uh, so let's not set up a duplicative process with this bill. I urge my colleagues to adopt my common sense amendment. And yield back my time. General Lady, I'll, yield, I'll yield to Mr. Peters. I'd like to thank the general lady. I just want to express some frustration. I'll support this amendment, um, but I actually am someone who's interested in dealing with the regulatory burden of dupl dupl duplicative environmental review. I actually practice law in this field. I think there's a lot of room for improvement. I think we can still achieve the same high environmental standards. But the frustrating thing for me is that this this uh, bill only had le legislative language was only released to us Tuesday night. Uh, I didn't see it until this morning. Um, I'm more than willing to sit down with anyone to talk about how we can improve it, but Ms. Castor raises a good question about whether this is already taken care of. Uh, and I'd like to have a conversation about, even on pipelines, which I'm, you know, I don't, there's no uh, particular pipeline business in my district like there is in Mr. Green's. Um, I think we owe it to the economy to, to streamline these <coughs> to the extent we can. I just feel like I've been really cut out of that process here. There's a real discussion to, to be had here. Uh, and the process that we've had here, the late, this late notice and last minute changes, this is much different from what we saw before, really prevents that kind of discussion. So I'm gonna vote with Ms. Castro on this amendment, I'll vote against this bill, but I wanted to signal explicitly to my colleagues that I'm willing to work on this in a serious way if, if you're interested, uh, and I yield back. General Lady yields back her time. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores. Uh, move strike last word. The, Mr. Chairman, uh, the amendment is really what's unnecessary. If we look at the Energy Policy Act of 2005, or I'll just call it the EP Act, FERC is designated as the lead agency for coordinating necessary environmental reviews and associated federal authorizations. As the lead agency, FERC often coordinates with a variety of federal, state, and local governments and Indian tribes to balance a wide range, wide ranging set of issues, including potential impacts on environmental and wildlife resources, land use, and property rights. That's what's under the EP Act. Unfortunately, the way that things have been uh, implemented uh, 
Uh, and despite the increased authority that was given to FERC under the EP Act, there's growing evidence that pipeline infrastructure approvals are being unnecessarily delayed uh, due to a lack of coordination or insufficient action among the agencies coordinating the permitting process. There was a December 2012 study uh, that found that since the enactment of the EP Act's permitting reforms, the occurrence of federal authorization delays exceeding 90 days has risen from 8% to 28%, while delays exceeding 180 days have risen from 3% to 20%. So that's the reason for the bill that we have uh, in front of us today. Uh, the overwhelming majority of Americans support expanding infrastructure to ensure stable, affordable supplies of energy. Uh, having sufficient supplies of natural gas is important to keeping electricity and home heating affordable and reliable and infrastructure is a smart investment for energy security, job goes, growth, and manufacturing. This amendment would je jeopardize those investments and the jobs that come with it. So I urge a no vote on the amendment and a yes vote on the underlying bill. I yield back. Gentlemen yields back, other members. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't want to keep uh, arguing this because I know we're almost at the end of the markup and actually getting done sooner than than I thought we would be. But, you know, I just don't understand how, you know, when we know that, and it's been said many times, that nearly 90% of pipeline projects are approved in less than a year, uh, why um, there's any, you know, notion out there that there's going to be, that there's significant delays. And it, you know, we're basically saying on our side that, you know, we want to make sure that there's proper review. And in this case, um, that, um, that the bill has a critical flaw because it seems that uh, it's largely duplicative of the streamlining provision included in the FAST Act, which was passed on a bipartisan basis last Congress. The FAST Act authorized the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council to improve the timeliness, predictability, and transparency of the Federal Environmental Review and authorization process for major infrastructure, infrastructure projects, including natural gas pipelines, the council is overseeing permitting for 32 major infrastructure projects, including seven interstate natural gas pipeline projects. And that process sets up enhanced coordination by establishing a lead agency for the project, recommended performance schedules and public project timetables, and increased transparency uh, throughout the review process. And when we had a legislative hearing on a substantially different form of this bill, FERC testified that a number of provisions in the bill will duplicate efforts of the council. I just can't, I have to believe that this bill is, is just, is not only a solution in search of a problem, it's a solution to a non-existent problem that was already solved by the FAST Act. And so I encourage all my colleagues to support this amendment so that we can get a determination as to whether this bill is truly duplicative of other federal efforts. And I expect that it is, so I would urge a vote in support of the Castor Amendment. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the bill? Seeing on the amendment, uh, seeing none, the vote occurs. On the uh, roll call vote is requested. Those in favor of the Castor Amendment will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Olson. No. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mr. Harper. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Long. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Bouchon votes no. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores votes no. Mr. Mullen. Mr. Mullen votes no. Mr. Hudson. Mr. Hudson votes no. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Kramer votes no. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters votes aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. 
Mr. Tonko. Aye. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Lobsack. Aye. Mr. Lobsack votes aye. Mr. Schrader. Aye. Mr. Schrader votes aye. Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Butterfield. Aye. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Chairman Upton. Votes no. Chairman Upton votes no. Members wishing to change the vote or cast a vote? Mr. Harper, how is it? Mr. Harper votes no. Other members? Seeing none, clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 13 ayes and 18 noes. 13 ayes, 18 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the vote occurs on, question occurs on 14 H.R. 2910 to the full committee. All those in favor, roll call vote is requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Olson. Aye. Mr. Olson votes aye. Mr. Barton. Correct. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Aye. Mr. Shimkus votes aye. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes aye. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes aye. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes aye. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes aye. Mr. Long. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Bouchon votes aye. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores votes aye. Mr. Mullen. Mr. Mullen votes aye. Mr. Hudson. Mr. Hudson votes aye. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Kramer votes aye. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, Mr. Walden votes aye. Mr. Rush, Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. McNerney, Mr. McNerney votes no. Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters votes no. Mr. Green, Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Doyle, Mr. Doyle votes no. Ms. Castor, Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Tonko. No. Mr. Tonko votes no. Mr. Lobsack. Mr. Lobsack votes no. Mr. Schrader. Mr. Schrader votes no. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy votes no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Chairman Upton. Votes aye. Chairman Upton votes aye. Other members wishing to, uh, Mr. how is uh, Mr. Murphy recorded? Mr. Murphy is not recorded. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Other members wishing to change your vote or cast a vote? Uh, Seeing none, the vote, uh, the clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 17 ayes and 14 noes. 17 ayes, 14 noes. The question on forwarding the bill uh, to the full committee is approved. And without objection, the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the legislation approved by the subcommittee today. So ordered. Without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you.